it's the ultimate adventure, really. It's the ultimate high, um, in my humble opinion, because when you're in a dream um, and you suddenly realize this isn't real, I'm dreaming. And then literally anything is possible because in the dreaming state, you can be or do anything. You can, you know, fly to space. You can meet celebrities. You can do whatever you want. And it's a really thrilling, thrilling experience. And I, I would love more people to experience it because once you do, you, you, you want to do it again and again and again because you want to role play in there. You want to experience things that simply you couldn't do in your waking life because either it's not safe or it would hurt other people or it's just just impossible. But in the dreaming state, you can be or do anything. And the confidence boost you get from that. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mind the Shift. I'm your host, as always, Anders Bolling. Today, I have a dream guest. She's a dream guest in every respect. And she's a returning guest, which make, makes me very happy to, to, to have her back. She's written tons of uh, books about esoteric matters like the afterlife, like angels, uh, astrology, premonition. But as I understand, mainly she has um, she dedicates her brilliant mind to dissecting our dream world and her latest book is called how to catch a dream it looks like this for those of you who are watching on youtube welcome back teresa chung hello this is like a recurring dream isn't it <laughs> it, is, it is i know and we had so many technical glitches uh, before we yeah. managed to record this so it's really like a dream the whole thing yeah i'm sorry i'm not in my normal location where i record videos so i'm really sorry i wasn't quite sure how the internet would hold but fingers crossed that uh, spirit is with us and we can we can talk to you because I, I i'm that introduction was delightful i particularly enjoyed the brilliant mind bit so <laughs> uh, well it's true and this book, uh, How to Catch a Dream, I think it was in the works uh, the last time yeah. we, we spoke about a year ago. And for those of you who didn't listen to that episode, it's episode number 55. It's uh, from April 2021. You, you were writing on this book, weren't you, back then? I, I was. And that episode must watch everyone. You know, it's like part one. You know, this is part two. <laughs> but exactly. yes, it was in, was in the works. I was, I was filled with ideas and researching and writing it. Um, I absolutely adored writing it. And, um, you know, I really hope it helps people have more vivid dreams, first of all, better dream recall, and then to potentially become lucid in, in, in them. And that means knowing you're dreaming when you're dreaming. Yes, let's talk talk more about that of course and i should say that we don't have very much time today so hopefully we will we will be able to to delve into all these myriad questions that that arise around these this this issue about dreaming and, and the dream world but um back then we when we spoke we spoke mainly about time and premonition it was about your around your book the premonition code which you wrote with together with julia mossbridge i think she's a, a cognitive psychologist or something like that Neuroscientist. Neuroscientist. Okay, scientist. sorry. That's a brilliant mind. Yeah. <laughs> that is a brilliant mind also. But we covered a lot of ground, of course. So we, we also delved into the, the, the realm of dreams, of course. So we will repeat ourselves today. But then again, I mean, life is a spiral. So, so it always repeats itself. But hopefully on a higher level at each higher level each time. <laughs> so we'll see if we spiral upwards or downwards today. So you told me in... in in that conversation that you don't really like to to write or speak for people who already are convinced that there is a non-physical world out there, but that you, on the contrary, love to convey this information to people who would initially laugh at it. So how pertinent yeah. then to write about dreams? Because I mean, even the most uh, hardcore materialists couldn't deny that, that they're dreaming. We all have dreams. So Teresa, how important is it to dream? Well, research shows that it's uh, emotionally, psychologically, and even physically healthy to have vivid dream recall. It's a sign of holistic well-being, and there's plenty of research to show that now. And I'm really glad that research is out there 
for all the naysayers who say dreams are nonsense, trivial, waste of time, you know, don't waste your time on it, that it's really good for you. So if you are unconvinced and think, you know, the non-physical world is all just airy, fairy, woo-woo, just remember you dream and that's a whole world of mystery there. And science and sleep and dream experts are now the overwhelming consensus, I'm glad to say. It's taken a while to get there because 20 years ago, it wasn't like that dreams are nonsense. You know, it's unseen, irrelevant. But now a lot of attention is being paid to dreams, the power of the mind when we are asleep, what happens in the mind and why on earth we get these incredible stories and dialogues and feelings and ideas, um, a bit like a Netflix series that runs in our mind yeah. night after night. And, um, you know, there's a lot of research into it now, partly because of the lockdown dream phenomenon, when everybody was reporting much more vivid dreams than ever before. There, there was a, a, an obvious reason for that, that we got more sleep and our mornings were more leisurely. And, you know, early morning tends to be the time when we have more REM, rapid eye movement stage of sleep. So, of course, we're going to have more vivid dream recall. But people really fell in love with their dreams during the lockdown, maybe because there was nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. well, they had, they still had Netflix, but then you had the internet yeah. Netflix as well. So You yeah. they had your own inner Netflix, um, which is... Um, And people began to see, you know, that what I've written about for decades, I've been beating this dream but drum for decades, that the dreams have something important to tell you about yourself, who you are, and what you need to do in your waking life to evolve. evolve. That so dreams you, yeah, are messy. Sorry. <laughs> would you say that, that, that the dream is, um, I mean, when we're dreaming, we, the dreams are still a, a valid part of consciousness. It's yeah. just as the waking consciousness, as, as valid as the, as the waking consciousness. For me, I mean, the reason I'm concentrating a lot of my research and writing and speaking and, and, and interviewing about it right now, dreams, is because, it, as you say, it's what people immediately understand. You don't need to talk about metaphysics or spirituality or anything. It's such a great entry point. So that's why I focused my energy on it. As you know, I write about all topics, mind, body and soul. But it's dreams that right now that is capturing people's imagination. And I'm loving that. I'm just going with it because dreams for me are the portal. They're the door. They're the opening to an awareness of yourself or the part of you that is invisible and unseen, unconscious and, you know, expansive and infinite and knows past, present and future and sees beyond the material. It is the entry point for an understanding of ourselves being spiritual beings having an, a human experience rather than human beings having a spiritual insights. So that's why I absolutely am going for it with dreams at the moment, not because it's all I write about, because I write about so much, but because it's just what people get at the moment. And yeah, but you have I, written a lot of books about dreams even before. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, ha I certainly have. And um, the interest continues. I mean, it's just in incredible. I'm being invited onto so many things to talk about dreams, you know, and you get supermodels like Bella Hadid posted my dream dictionary on to her 46 million followers. Um, you know, things like that would, that would never have happened 20, 30 years ago. Um, that where, you know, I was writing about dreams then in the early 2000s. There's always been a niche interest in it, but not this mainstream interest and I do credit the younger generation actually um, because I feel that they are they are the way forward well obviously they are but I think their interest in the inside out approach mm. to life mindfulness meditation manifesting all these words which tie in so neatly with dreams and I, I actually think dreams are a form of manifesting um, that it, they are the ones who are going to help get the world out of the sticky situation it is in right now, where the older generation, with its focus on material stuff and what you, you know, what's outside of you defines you, um, you know, um, has caused all the traumas in the world right now. You know, people not healing from the inside out and inflicting their inner trauma on the world. I mean, that's what we're seeing now in situations like Ukraine and stuff. You know, mm. Putin is tortured inside. Right? And, and that inner pain is being inflicted on, on the world. And we see that time and time again, that people are trying to change the world without changing themselves first. Yeah. And that's 
That's the reason you've got to work on, please don't change the world, change yourself first. And if more uh, well, it depends that, on how you interpret your dreams, I guess. I mean, I guess people like Putin and other dictators, they, they also have dreams, but they uh, yeah, yeah, interpret but they, them in a different way, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, this is probably not the podcast to talk about it, but I, I find this fascinating because, you know, they're human beings too. Why would you inflict such pain and suffering? Mm. And, and frequently it happens because the, within them, there's no sense of, of soul or inner self, or inner calm. And it's inflicted on the outside world. And you see that time and time again. We see that with celebrities, you know, warring against each other or, you know, having addictions and everything. It's all people who have failed to, to pay attention to their inner world and to work on their inner well-being and to realize that until you feel content from the inside out, nothing you do in the world will matter. I mean, you see it right now with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp look at these people they're beautiful they have money popularity the most exciting i mean being in these movies how exciting is that they have everything we think we want for a charmed life and yet because the inner trauma the inner pain the inner work hasn't been done they haven't paid attention to their dreams the messages from their intuition what a mess mm. So I really, in a way, I'm glad it's happening. It's playing out in the world, especially with the celebrities at the moment, like with Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. You can actually see everything you're striving for, massive popularity, charisma, exciting career, beautiful cheekbones, money, fame, everything that we think defines a successful life. What's the point? I mean, look at them now. It doesn't mean anything when you when you end yeah. up in those kinds of. Well, I haven't actually. I don't know much about that conflict, but I've <laughs> seen something about it. I try not to get too no, much too involved in that kind of. You know, you're much more spiritual than I am. I must. <laughs> I find it. I find it absolutely fascinating. But I do look at it from a mystical perspective, and I can see what what it is. If these people are have not done the inner work, they haven't paid m enough attention to their intuition by day, their dreams at night, to their inner world, healing their inner child, all this talk we have. And then what happens is they try and get all that validation outside in their relationships, in, in career, in money, in popularity. And it doesn't work when you do the outside. Work. You've got to do the inside out. And that's why yeah. I love dreams, because dreams are about inside out. Yeah, speaking of doing the inner work you your book has the subheading 21 ways to dream and live bigger and better uh, can you explain that how so dream and live bigger and better what do you what do you mean by that um research again shows that your dreaming mind and your waking mind are one they're interconnected and both influence each other your dreams can influence your waking life your waking life can influence their, your dreams of course they do because you're it's your consciousness people s separate waking and and sleeping you know like you're a such different person when you go into the dream world you're not it's your consciousness um that you that you meet in your dreams and 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 interact with on a symbolic level so if you can influence your dreams and understand your dreams when you're asleep, that's going to have a knock-on confidence-boosting effect in your waking life. And similarly, if you live your waking life with an open mind, non-judgmental, and a sense of gratitude and excitement and positive expectation, you're going to have more rewarding dreams. The two are completely linked. But mm. sometimes it's easier to start the work in the unconscious level on your dreams. And that's why dream work is incredibly powerful because when you're asleep and dreaming, the waking mind often doesn't know, the, the, the mind doesn't know the difference between when you're awake and when you're asleep. So if you do something in a dream, say you're nervous about public speaking and you do an amazing talk in your dream, the mind kind of thinks, well, you've been there, you've done that, you can do it. And that's powerful. You can actually practice skills in your dreams, um, role play, be or do anything and the confidence boost will show in your waking life i mean i don't know if you you know had flying dreams whenever i have flying dreams and i, I enjoy the experience of the dream whether i'm aware i'm flying or not the next morning when i wake up i really feel quite literally <laughs> i can fly 
the confidence levels are very high. Yeah, I've yeah. noticed that, that when my dreams are expansive and creative and exciting, and I'm going out of my comfort zone in my dreams, that's important because life is all about going out of your comfort zone, not staying in it. And in dreams, you can. So my, life, my, my day is so much more expansive. The two are linked. Mm. Yeah, it, it, your book is actually very hands-on. It's it's a guidebook, more or less, really, and and yes, it's, it's pretty concrete. And it's uh, and you stick to to established psychology and and neuroscience and things like that. But I know you at towards the end you touch upon these very big, deep quote unquote uh, issues, which I'd love to touch uh, on also here. But firstly, you recommend, for instance, I mean, twenty one ways is actually twenty one steps to reaching the the point where you can actually have lucid dreams and we, we will talk more about what lucid dreams is but you recommend people uh from from the start for instance to read more novels to watch movies and even play computer games is that to kind of lubricate imagination or what what is well, that? If, i mean if you want to have vivid dreams you need to give your brain nutrients you need to give your brain um symbols that it can use to speak to you because your dreaming mind speaks to you in the language of symbols if during the day you're not you know using your imagination thinking creatively um uh, thinking in terms of symbols and the reason i suggest novels and games is because they often speak in a symbolic language i mean if you go back to your literature classes at school when you studied poetry and novels it was all about the hidden meaning beneath the surface like you know the the, the author's use of metaphor of imagery of of symbolism of puns of figurative language you need to sort of start thinking like that again because we used to in ancient times you know ancient man was very good at thinking symbolically but sadly over time um with science and technology we've got very much on the surface we think of, of you know is a black and white meaning but we need to go to that way of thinking where there's hidden meanings beneath the surface of things and novel reading gaming watching fantastic movies, visiting an art gallery, reading poetry can ignite that dreaming language, the language that we need. You need to learn how your dreams talk to you. They talk to you in that visionary, artistic, fantastical, symbolic way. So first of all, you need to activate that again and just do it in your in your waking life more. It's, it's very rewarding. It's fun as well. There's a reason why, you know, millions and millions fall in love with with games like Skyrim or movie franchise like Harry Potter. It's the symbolism. Mm. It's the deeper meaning. We don't just watch Harry Potter because for a story. We watch Harry Potter because you see Harry Potter meeting his shadow in Voldemort and understanding that death ends a life, not a relationship, because at the end he meets all the people that he's loved and lost in spirit. That's what we watch it for. Yeah. these great movies but we don't realize that at the time and that that so but you know the more you sort of like in practice alternate realities and symbolic ways of approaching life in your waking life the more vivid and revealing and insightful your dreams are going to be your dreaming mind wants to talk to you every single night it has so much to say so fit, wonderful Teresa what can you let's just go into this uh, i mean the theme of this book or the the, the end of this book the uh, the the point of it <laughs> so to speak lucid <laughs> dreaming lucid dreaming i mean uh there's i i, I suppose there is a there is a, um what you call a scale from ordinary vivid dreams to lucid dreaming but can you explain what a lucid dream is for those of um, the audience well, who don't really understand that. Well, it's, it's the ultimate adventure, really. It's the ultimate high, um, in my humble opinion, because when you're in a dream um, and you suddenly realize, this isn't real, I'm dreaming. And then literally anything is possible because in the dreaming state, you can be or do anything. You can, you know, fly to space, you can meet celebrities, you can do whatever you want. And it's a really thrilling, thrilling experience. And I, I would love more people to experience it because once you do, you, you, you want to do it again and again and again because you want to role play. 
in there. You want to experience things that simply you couldn't do in your waking life because either it's not safe or it would hurt other people or it's just just impossible. But in the dreaming state, you can be or do anything. And the confidence boost you get from that. The, and also so you can sense, kind of test things in the dream first? Yes. And then you, can... you can do anything. Just think about it. There are no limits. The only thing missing in a dream state is logic and reason. And when that's suspended, anything's possible. So go for it. And just also get in touch with the part of you that's so expansive and infinitely creative. And I believe that's the part of you that is your soul. That, that likely survives bodily death, get in touch with that part. And then when you return to your waking life, you come back almost like people come back from near-death experiences with an idea that I am more than this body. There so it's that, it's that powerful, you mean, to have a lucid dream? Yeah, it is that powerful because you know that you are more than this material form, that there's a part of you that is expansive, infinite, timeless, immortal, and there's a part of you. Which I, I mean, I can't offer proof because I haven't died and gone to heaven myself, but I believe it's the part of you that survives bodily death. And you're meeting that in a lucid dream. Well, the door to that anyway, I think that it's even more will, will be revealed to us. But I think that a lucid dream is a door, an opening to that, to our consciousness, to the part of us that, you know, yeah. science is trying to understand. I'm trying to Do we have to, to train to be able to, to have lucid dreams or, or can, it, can it happen spontaneously? Well, there are people who believe that you can train to lucid dream and there are certain techniques um, that you can go on courses for and they're very draining actually because they involve being woken up repeatedly during the night. Now, these techniques can result in lucid dreams and they're actually being used to heal trauma in veterans, um, using lucid dreaming techniques to heal, you know, to, to heal past traumatic stress disorder and I think that that's a really beautiful thing to do there are studies at the moment showing that the lucid dreaming techniques where um, veterans can revisit scenes of trauma and bring healing to it in the lucid dreaming state is very very powerful that's very exciting research that you know can you can use the lucid dreaming potential to heal inner pain um, but I wouldn't recommend those techniques because they disrupt the sacred power of sleep I think sleep is sacred and, um, you know, anything that's going to wake you up in the night is not good for your health and well-being. So I'm very much um, in this book championing the let it happen naturally. Don't try to force it with these complicated techniques because that will cause stress. And whenever you um, bring stress into it or try to force something, I, I don't feel that that's the right way. But if you can fall in love with your dreams Get into the habit of writing your dream down every single morning. Um, do all the things during the day that can increase the likelihood of clear dream recall. Sooner or later, you are going to have a lucid dream. Because it makes sense. If you aren't recalling your dreams regularly, how on earth do you think you can have a lucid dream? Mm. The first the most important step is to, you know, a lot of us do forget our dreams. And there are reasons for that, which I outline in the book, is to get into a regular habit of keeping a dream journal. And just enjoying dreaming, not necessarily with any sense of expectation, but enjoying it as a, a kind of introduction to your intuition and the part of you that has a lot to say and a lot to comment on and wants to give you messages about how you can move forward in your waking life. Because that's the majority of dreams want to do that. They want to give you information that can help you with particular challenges you may be facing. And that you need to understand how your dreams speak to you. Again, the, the book talks about that. Yeah. Um, so just, just carry on dreaming, really, is what I'm saying. And don't force it. And then the lucid dreams, trust me, they will come. You know, I dream a lot. And I almost every morning I, when I wake up, I, have, I remember my dreams, but the, the latest dreams, or at least I have a sense of having been somewhere in some, some other alternative state of, <laughs> state of mind. Uh, but I, I, I can't say that I have had a dream that was, uh, um, I mean, um, inequivocally lucid, but maybe there were some, some in-between states because I often or many times have, dreamt, have had dreams where I, at some stage, at some point, realize that something very strange and also sp perhaps spooky that is about to occur isn't 
going to be that dangerous. I mean, I, I just, I, I mean, it's it's spooky and it's eerie when I approach it or when it be begins happening. But then some part of me or my part of my dream character realizes that, wait a minute, this is not going to be dangerous. But I, I'm, it's not that I'm saying to myself, this is a dream. I'm just, I just kind of, I had this yesterday, actually, I, I woke up and realized that I had dreamt that me and a couple of friends were trying to open a box of some kind. I don't have to go into the details, but the box was full of full of dirt and it had to we had to get rid of some a lot of the dirt and when we'd done that in different ways uh there was a mummy in there a mummy uh, a dead body and that was a bit spooky and 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 then this mummy opened its eyes and and uh, got up and started walking and i initially I, I got scared in the dream but then i realized hey wait wait a minute this isn't going to be scary this is just not, this yeah. is not, I mean, is that some kind of a precursor or, or a, um, in an in-between state between a, a vivid That's dream and a lucidity. dream? That is lucidity. You are lucid and you don't know it. <laughs> is it? You are lucid. Of course it is. Anytime you have an awareness that this is a dream, you are on, on, the, on the edges of lucidity. And, you know, you need to, to, um, to develop that because... I need, yeah, you, I need to foster you, that in a way. Because what you could have done then in the dream is talk to the dumb mummy and say, why are you here? What message have you got for me? <laughs> yes. And the mummy would have told you. You could have had a conversation with it, you see. It's limiting yourself. But we do that in our waking life all the time that we put down limits. Oh, this isn't going to work. This doesn't make sense. Or I'm frightened of that. Or I'm no good. This is what we do. And basically, if you can do that in the dream state first, if you can sort of like remove the limitation of why can't I speak to the mummy I've created in my own unconscious, after all, that mummy belongs to you. You are the creator and director of it. You made the dream. So you are in charge of it. And you can take ownership of that mummy in your dream. When you can do that in your dream, you will do that in all other areas of your waking life too. Because the dream is like, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it. I mean, it's, it sounds a cliche. It is true. Mm. So and next I, time I meet a mummy, I'm not going to be scared. I know I can no, just talk, talk to it. them. <laughs> talk to them. Say, why are you here? What have you got yeah. to say? And most of the time, these frightening images and figures in our dreams, they want our attention. They have got so that mummy wants to tell you something. It doesn't want you to be scared. It doesn't want you to put it on a pedestal. It doesn't want you to go, oh, this is so mystical. It wants to just interact with you. Sometimes they want a hug, these monsters in our dreams. They just want a hug. <laughs> they just want to say, you are a part of me. Yeah. You know, there's, there's night and day within all of us. They just want your acknowledgement. They want the God that created them, the dream God, which is you, to love them mm. for all their sins. I, yeah, I remember when I was younger, I had this dream that I was falling and I died every time. And then uh, all of a sudden, I, I, I think I was a teenager or something. And then one, one night I, I realized in the dream, just much like, like this, this thing with the mummy, that, wait a minute, I've been through this before. I'm not going to die. And then I stopped having that dream. But maybe I should have stayed there and continued to realize, continued realizing that I was dreaming. And then I could fly. Then I would have been able to fly. But I just woke up, I guess, and then stopped having that dream. Yeah, our falling dreams are often a sign that some big change is about to occur, some big shift as well. It's kind of your dreaming mind. I do think there's precognitive elements in dreams too. Of course, I would with the premonition code. But it's some kind of warning. There's a big shift coming. Forgive the pun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was a precursor to my, to my podcast, yeah. So um, we all often, I mean, this was... The example that I gave here was <laughs> with a mummy, but most of the time in the dreams we meet uh, friends and family members. Yes, isn't that true? Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, and, and as far as I understand from reading your book and from hearing it from other places, also and other other sources, uh, these characters are aspects of ourselves, which is logical because everything is happening within my within one yeah. mind. So there are aspects of us. So if I'm lucid in a dream and I meet friends or family members and I, I i interact with them how how does that work i mean if they if they are aspects of me how do they do they can i speak to them? can you. i ask them questions that i would in my waking life or is it yes. like i'm talking to yes. myself or how should i interpret that I mean, 
this is the Jungian approach really to, to dream interpretation. We're talking about that everything in your dream is like the royal road to the unconscious. It's all as archetypal aspects of who you are from the inside out. And of course, if you all the people in your dream, if you, if you approach your dream interpretation in that way, and I do favor the Jungian approach in all my dream interpretation, deeply psychological. I mean, there are many schools of dream interpretation and I kind of pick what I like from all of them, but you know, the Jungian one is the one that I find the most clarity with. And, and this is that you are everything, not just the people, but also the landscape, the objects, the sounds, the colors, the feelings are aspects of your inner world dramatized as it were symbolically. Right. It's like, you know, it's like if you were a painting, you're stepping into a painting of you. And yes, of course, you should talk to them because there are aspects of you that you haven't acknowledged, that you don't fully understand yet, or that you need to discover within yourself because they, they can offer the, the way forward. They're all aspects of you crying out for more understanding, more development. And that's what's so exciting about the people in our dreams. And again, we just go to bed every night, you know, and we have a dream. We wake up in the morning and say, oh, I dreamt I was at a party at last night and I met my departed uncle, whatever. There's so much in there. Mm. If only people would just take time to reflect, write down that dream. And then later in the day, I don't recommend dream decoding in the morning. It's the worst time to do it. You need to get on with your day. Do it before you go to bed, because that's also good. If you dream decode before you go to bed, you set the intention to dream unconsciously anyway, because you're pondering dreamings. And what you think on before you go to bed increases the likelihood of more dreams. Reflect on them at night, brainstorm around them and see what messages come. You know, what was your departed uncle, for example? What what? personality traits did he have that you recognize in yourself or that you could benefit on you know the other people in your dreams what what do they represent who are they to you remember it's not them yeah but this them. is the, inter the intriguing part of this is i mean there are many intriguing parts but one is that we often we so often meet in our dreams people or characters in the dreams that look like or we, we um, interpret as our friends and family members, close people that are close to us. And if they are aspects of ourselves, then, I mean, if, if they were every time new people that we met, they, that would, I mean, be an internal thing than within, within your mind or your psyche that it was different aspects of yourself. But you actually meet these people that you know from your waking life. So this is, a, now this is a profound question here. I don't know if you have the answer, <laughs> but but you might ponder it or or have some kind of, kind of thing to say about it uh, do you think that this means if these if these people are aspects of ourselves in our dreams is it even the case that they are these people or everybody that we meet in life in our waking life are also aspects of the one consciousness that we are all parts of that we are all aspects of of, of the one consciousness so to speak in our waking life I mean, oh, you are so, so wise. I mean, increasingly, <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to advise people actually to interpret their waking life as if it was a dream. Yeah. To bring their dream decoding skills from their, which first of all, start with your dreaming mind, because that's easier because it's so surreal and exciting. Uh, but, but once you've got the hang of your personal symbols and how your dreaming mind speaks to you, I would really encourage you to actually start approaching your waking life in exactly the same way what's the hidden meaning behind this situation what does this person trigger in me when you do that dream decoding skills to waking life life is so fascinating and you start looking for signs and hidden meanings and it, you become like a detective all the time a dream decoding detective and you realize that this life is so interesting so that that's an advanced state but i would encourage that yeah <laughs> looking and also that would help increase the likelihood of lucid dreams as well, because every time you do that, you're in a way doing a reality check, you know, saying, am I dreaming right now or, or not, you know, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I would encourage people to do that more and more and more. Hmm. <laughs> you probably feel a bit, a bit silly when you, when you begin doing that, but then you get used to it, I guess. It's fun. It's fun. And that's the trouble with spirituality. I think a lot of spirituality is torturous and serious and uh, heavy. And uh, there's not enough fun 
in it, you know, and uh, I think approaching life in that way brings much more fun, <laughs> a much needed dose of fun. Wonderful. You take yourself less seriously. And, you know, dreams also offer you an opportunity to get over yourself because a lot of us do take ourselves way too seriously. And as I often say, you, you matter, you're important, but in the general scheme of things, you're not that important. No, you're not that important, <laughs> but you're also a part of all there is in a way. So, yeah. you, you, I mean, you're all important and we're not important at the same time. I exactly. Mean, it's, yeah. it's about embracing opposites. Exactly. Dreams help you to embrace and understand opposites. And that's what life is. Life is complicated. Life, sometimes there are no answers. There are no solutions. And I think sometimes in spiritual growth, we look for what's the answer definitive approach here and it's it, what I think as I get older I don't know if this is a sign of age is that you become more and more comfortable with questions not knowing and that state of of um yeah you, you can you can kind of rest in that state really it's yeah it, it makes life very much more interesting when, when you don't know everything yeah it would be terrible if you knew everything I mean in this world at least on this planet uh, in this three-dimensional world it would Probably be 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 uh, torturous to know everything, but on some we wouldn't learn if we knew everything. It's like you wouldn't learn, you wouldn't no. grow, you wouldn't evolve, and we're here to evolve. That's what we're here to. We are here to evolve and learn the lessons of this material world. You know, and some of them are very painful. But I've come to the conclusion that when you're going through painful times, it's because it's a sign that you are ready to evolve. It's like a boiling kettle. You know, just before the kettle boils, that you know, the, the 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 noise and the steam is at the loudest, and that's what personal pain sometimes is. It is a sign you are ready for the reset. You are ready for your spirit to upgrade now, hmm. right? It's a try, interesting try, analogy, yeah. Yeah, to try and see personal pain and trauma, which you know is regrettable, but happens. It's a part of life. We all have times in our life when we fail or have a bereavement or a heartbreak or disappointment or things don't go right. And we feel the dark night of the soul, as it were, that is a, a clear sign, a very positive sign that your spirit wants to get you back in alignment with the wonderful life you should be living and the sense of inner peace you should be having. And it's telling you, you need to now, your soul needs to upgrade to integrate this experience and to learn from it, right? Yeah. I mean, what we ultimately want to get to is the state where nothing phases us because we realize we are um, a soul having a, a human experience. And that's very hard because we're in the human body. But, you know, it's like that famous Kipling poem, Treat Triumph and Disaster, Those Imposters Just the Same. I mean, again, great spiritual wisdom in a poem. And mm. in a way, that's what the journey of our lives is, that we care and we have empathy and compassion, but what happens to us in the external world does not phase us. I agree. Fantastic. I think we have it a few minutes. doesn't make us lose our center. We have yeah. a few minutes more before you, you need to go. Is that, that, that right? Yeah? Yes, I've got five. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to, to, the, to, to the movie world. <laughs> we talked last time about, about all these Hollywood blockbusters that are more spiritual and esoteric than many people realize. And we mentioned the film Inception, of course, which is crucial to, to dreaming. It is about uh, lucid dreaming. Uh, and But as far as I remember, Inception is, in Inception, they are dreaming collectively. It's collective dreaming. Can that happen? And in that case, how, yeah. how does that work? I don't know. I mean, that shared dreaming experiences are real. I mean, it tends to happen with, um, you know, parents and their children or, you know, partners, people who are, have a strong empathetic bond in waking life, twins, for example, the shared dreaming experience. And um, if you've ever had it with someone you're very close to, you, you come down for breakfast in the morning and say, I had a dream, you know, that I was at the zoo and I met, I talked to a giraffe and the other person says, oh my goodness, I was at that zoo. In I my was the giraffe. And you were there, <laughs> you know, but that's the one, that's such, isn't that a blissful moment? Yeah. That some, in some, you know, that, you know, there's somewhere in some invisible realm, your souls have connected and it's beautiful. 
it's beautiful. But I do think collective dreaming, I mean, we know before events like 9-11 that a lot of people were dreaming about the towers and planes. You know, we know that in 2019, myself included, I was having lots of dreams about people wearing masks. Oh, really? You know, and, yeah, a lot of people were sending me dreams about wearing masks or, you know, of stumbling and these kind of things. You, it, the thing is with dream work, you have to look at it in hindsight. And that's why... It, a dream journal is so we get too hung up on interpreting one dream but you've got to understand first of all dreams talk to us constantly and sometimes dreams comment on other tre- dreams like a tv series you love it runs you need to watch all the episodes and the only way to do that is to keep a dream journal and i would recommend keeping a dream journal on one side of the page and your waking journal on the other side, because what you need to learn is to see how your dreaming mind is commenting on what is happening currently in your life. But you won't be able to do that unless you keep a record for at least 30 days, at least, because then you can look back and you can, you'll can you see this kind of like commentator, this sort of mystical commentator on your waking reality. You will get it. And maybe it's maybe it's a, it's 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 a pre, you can you can find pre-cog, precognitive dreams also when yes. you go back and, and read your journals because that was that was my next question are there other precognitive dreams and are there dreams about what appears to be even past lives and can are they then lucid? Yeah, yeah I mean that that you know I do think that there's a precognitive element in all our dreams in every dream you have I believe your dreaming mind is is giving you a sign an indication of your potential, and I stress potential future, bearing in mind you always have free will in your waking life. So do look out for precognitive elements in your dreams. And again, if you keep your journal over a period of several weeks, you're going to see those precognitive elements. You're going to see how a symbolic scenario in your dream literally played out several days later. You will see that, but you must must keep doing it. Um, But there are other, you know, psychic dreams that happen and that's a very rare category of dreams I say we're talking about the 99% of dreams that are symbolic psychological but you know there is this 1% of dreams that are completely defy that um, explanation and you know they are even more exciting but well, I think every dream is exciting but these psychic dreams where you may be interact with departed loved ones, you ha- get telepathic information about things that you couldn't possibly know, shared dreaming, as you mentioned. Um, I think these are super normal dreams um, and they should be studied and they are being studied. Um, again, they point to just how much we don't know about consciousness. Um, <laughs> yeah. but they are rare. And I, I can't think of anything more important than than to to study these to study consciousness what what we actually are and what we can yeah. become and what we can be. Absolutely, um, I, as I said, I'm more and more falling in love with the science of consciousness, working with scientists and neuroscientists who are studying this. And isn't it amazing development that in this finally we've got to the stage when scientists are researching what is unseen. I mean, there are research studies on telepathy. There are research studies on dreams. There are research studies on intuition and our sixth sense, precognition or presentiment, as it's called in scientific terms. The scientists are studying what they, 50 years ago, they wouldn't have touched because Mm. it's invisible. It's not something you can see. So they're doing all these studies on things we can't see, the power of the unseen which at the end of the day, I think it's what's unseen in life that gives life its meaning. Yeah, it's wonderful that they're finally doing this. Mm. Teresa Chang, it's a true delight to have you on the show. Let's do this again a year from now. (laughs) Let's make it a series. Like a recurring dream or nightmare, depending on your perspective. Yeah, depending on how you find this. You're very prolific. You, you you write books all the time. Are you, will you drill deeper into the dream world, or, or do you have other projects? I'm, I'm at the moment. I'm working on a book on the inner psychic, the part of us oh. that um, can potentially predict our future. So yes, I never stop. <laughs> you never stop. We love it. 
just like consciousness, it's infinite. There's Teresa Chung, but I'll probably still be writing them on, on the other side. They won't be able to stop me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Teresa, and good luck Thank with everything. You. Thank you so much, Anders. If you liked this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. And you can follow Mind the Shift on Facebook and Instagram. And you can follow me, Anders Bolling, on all the main social media and also on medium.com. Thank you.